Welcome again. Today we consider topic 2.5.4 to describe and explain the transfer and transformation of materials as it flows through an ecosystem. It's a good idea for us to tie this up with topic 1.1.7, something we have looked at previously and to remind ourselves of the meaning of a transfer and a transformation. So let's consider those two terms, transfer or transformation. Here in the Sahara Desert, sand sometimes gets taken by wind all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to the Caribbean and to the Western Hemisphere. This Sahara dust is an example of a transfer because there is no change of state or form. Now for transformation. What better way to consider the term transformation? than to look at this creature. Perhaps nature's most miraculous transformation from egg to caterpillar to pupa and then to the majestic butterfly. These stages in the life cycle of this insect represent transformations. It is clear that there is a change of form, eggs giving rise to larva or caterpillar, and then to the restful pupal stage and ultimately, out of this cocoon emerges the adult butterfly, transformation. With that simple review of transfer and transformation, let's consider this picture of the world famous Niagara Falls. What are some transfers and transformations that you can identify in relation to the water cycle in this picture as the water flows from the top part to the bottom part and all the way out in this direction in that direction as some of the mist from the plunging down of the water gets scattered all over in all directions all of that is no more than a transfer. As the sun's energy beats down on the liquid water and it evaporates, going up into the atmosphere and forming these clouds of water vapor, then that is an example of a transformation brought about by a change of state from liquid to gas. And then sometime later as the clouds travel away from this site and the moisture cools, then it rains again. And gas is converted into liquid. This is another transformation. And if you visit the falls during the winter season, you're likely to see water in the solid state, another transformation. But this is not the complete picture of the water cycle. The plants that grow on these rocks, they too take up water from the soil. Water evaporates from the surface of the leaves of these plants. And that evapotranspiration 
is another means by which water goes from the liquid state into the gas state in the atmosphere. Sometimes water percolates down into the soil and gets stored underground for long periods of time, remaining in the liquid state, however, and still being a transfer. Ultimately, the water might be extracted in a spring and come to the surface and flow into rivers, or it may be taken out by a well, but that too would be a simple transfer, for there is no change of form, like the case of the butterfly, and there is no change of state. Imagine a sphere around the cow, creating a closed system. Would this organism be sustained within its closed system? And what cycling of matter would occur? The answer to this question connects to discussions from several of our previous lessons. How does the grass grow? The grass are photosynthetic organisms, autotrophic organisms. They use light and they take in carbon dioxide, they consume carbon dioxide and they release oxygen as they photosynthesize. This taking in of carbon dioxide from the air or fixing of carbon dioxide, making it a part of the organic matter of the plant is a transformation. The plant grows and it's consumed by the cow, the food material that's ingested is digested in the cow's system and then it's assimilated by the cow. The cow and also the grass carry out respiration, releasing carbon dioxide into the air and consuming oxygen. So there is an output of carbon dioxide from the grass when they carry out respiration and of course from the cow. When the cow passes out its feces, if it dies and it decays in the soil, then a host of decomposers begin degrading the dead organic matter. Soil itself with organic matter would show an increase in carbon dioxide and a decrease in oxygen as a result of the respiration of soil organisms including bacteria, fungi and other organisms. But this is not the only cycling of matter that goes on in our imaginary closed system. There is another element one that's much more prominent in the atmosphere that's also cycled. And that essential component of proteins and that component that makes up 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas. Nitrogen exists as a gas in the air, but as an element, it's an important part of proteins and it enters the soil as nitrate ions or ammonium ions organisms like the mung bean and other leguminous plants contain special swellings in their roots called nodules and these root nodules 
provide homes for special kinds of bacteria that take nitrogen gas out of the air and enrich the soil with nitrates. There is much more, however, to this nitrogen cycle. The Venus flytrap is a well-known plant for the fact that it's carnivorous. It's a plant that gets its nitrogen from the air. And most plants get their nitrogen from the soil. Some, like the mung beans and other legumes, get theirs from a close symbiotic relationship in which the legume provides a place for the bacteria to reside and the bacteria in turn provide nitrates for the plant. And an excellent example of mutualism is this association between species like the bacterium rhizobium and leguminous plants. The Venus flytrap gets its nitrogen from the air in a sense, but it comes from the solid protein structures of insects that it traps. These insects are then digested by special enzymes and nitrate gets into the plant from a very unusual source that hovers in the air. This of course is not to say that the flytrap takes nitrogen gas in by diffusion, but what it does is it converts the nitrogen that resides in the protein structures of insects into nitrates that it would use to build its own structures. And that too is a transformation. Not all of the nitrogen fixation that occurs happens through the root nodule bacteria of leguminous plants. Much of the fixation or the conversion of gaseous nitrogen into nitrate ions in the soil occurs by means of free-living bacteria in the soil. Another source of nitrates for plants comes from the decomposition of urine, which is rich in ammonia, by other types of bacteria that convert ammonium ions first to nitrites and then into nitrates. These are referred to as the nitrifying bacteria. And then, in wet soils particularly, there is a type of bacteria that does the reverse of the nitrogen fixers. The denitrifying bacteria are very abundant in wet soils. And it's true to say that wet soils are very poor in nitrates. This kind of habitat that allows the denitrifying bacteria to thrive converts the nitrates into nitrogen gas in the air. And as a result of that, very few plants can thrive in these wet, boggy type soils. The flytrap, however, has a very unusual adaptation, and this allows it to hold on to this very unusual niche in the plant kingdom and to thrive in areas where most other species cannot survive. If you can put all of these pieces together, then you are beginning to get the picture of the nitrogen cycle. This picture can also remind you of the carbon cycle, carbon dioxide coming out of all of our animals at all times in respiration and carbon dioxide entering the Venus flytrap, which is photosynthetic. The fact that it gets nutrients from the ingestion of these insects does not mean that it is in any way not an autotroph. It still makes its own nutrients through the photosynthetic process. Now it's time for you to stop at this point. Go into your textbook 
and read the relevant sections on the carbon, nitrogen, and the water cycle. So now that you're back, I would like you to take all of these terms and organize them into some kind of sequence that you can use to represent the carbon cycle. It may not include the very same words that were mentioned in your text. There may be some things that are on here that's not in your text and vice versa, but certainly there would be a lot in common. Your task is to organize a flowchart type diagram to show the storages, the flows, the transfers and the transformations that occur in the carbon cycle. Next, I would like you to stop and do the same for the nitrogen cycle. Note that there are three types of bacteria in this cycle, each playing a critical role in ensuring that nitrogen gas from the air stays at 78% although nitrates flow throughout the system. So once again you will mention the storages, the flows, the transfers and the transformations. And Like you did previously you will go into your text when you're finished and compare your answers to what's presented in the textbook. So by now, we would have a very good grasp of the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle. We would be able to use the term transfer, transformation, storage, and flow with some level of confidence and comfort. Let's consider this picture of a grasshopper in its natural habitat. When we come to class, we will discuss this issue. Vivarium hobbyists often experiment with closed systems. I want you to make a list of things that you would consider if you had to create a closed vivarium with centipedes and grasshoppers in an area of 5 by 5 by 5 meters. If your system works, would you expect its mass to change at any point? And when and why? Outline the carbon, nitrogen, and water cycle in this particular system, which means your vivarium, and then identify the aspects of the cycle presented in the text that don't apply to your system. And coming soon in the future, I want you to do some thinking about these questions. What are some anthropogenic influences, human influences, on the carbon, nitrogen, and water cycles? and explain how these influences can alter the steady-state equilibrium of ecosystems.